I want to continue our discussion of the link layer in Chapter 3 of Tannenbaum, and um, I'm going to do that by talking a little bit about Reed-Solomon codes. They're mentioned in Chapter 3, uh, but not in great detail, so I want to go into them in a little bit more detail, and uh, enough detail to give you a good idea of why they're useful and to uh, help point you in the right direction if you want to learn more about Reed-Solomon codes. Now, Reed-Solomon codes are important not just because they are useful in network uh, transmissions, but they're also used in RAID systems where we try to store data on systems of hard drives so that the uh, data can still be recovered even if one or more of the hard drives is lost or damaged. And Reed-Solomon codes have also been used to uh, store data on music CDs and DVDs and Blu-rays to help make them immune to scratches. So they have many applications, and which is why I think they're useful to learn, because um, where else are you going to learn them? Uh, I don't. I think this might be the only course in our uh, program where you might learn anything about Reed Solomon codes. Okay, now in order to begin this discussion, let me first give a review of where we are in our discussion of networks. Okay, so um, here, the link layer. Uh, now, what does the link layer do? Uh, the link layer uh, receives packets from the network layer. So when you imagine uh, communication networks as being in layers from the application layer at top all the way down through the physical layer at the bottom, and uh, you can think of each layer as being autonomous in that the layer on the transmitter talks to the equivalent layer on the receiver, and the layer gets data and information from the layers above, and it utilizes the layer below to help it do its job. Okay, so the link layer is the second layer up from the bottom, the bottom being the physical layer. We've already talked a lot about the physical layer. Uh, the physical layer being uh, a fiber optic optical communication system, or the physical layer can be a microwave Wi-Fi system. It can be a electric current Ethernet cable. It can be many different physical systems that can be used to transmit the data in a network. And uh, the link layer is one layer above the physical uh, layer. It takes packets from the network layer above. And the, the packets are then divided into frames. Let's say, I'm saying divided, but uh, presumably you could also take multiple packets and assemble multiple packets into a single frame. But let's say we take a, a packet, we divide it into 10 frames, then each of those 10 frames is passed on down to the physical layer, where the physical layer then takes the uh, data in the frames and transmits it as a binary sequence, uh, either pulses of light if you're talking about an optical layer or something similar. Uh, and, and what the physical layer is only concerned about the individual bits, transmitting the individual bits, the link layer um, is uh, taking these groups of data, these frames, and, and, and transmitting the frames across. So we go through this whole process going from layer above to layer below. So the link layer takes packets from the network layer, breaks them up into frames, and then may, maybe it adds error correction and error detection so that when the frames are transmitted, we can determine if a frame has been correctly transmitted or not. And um, 
And then on the receiver end, all these frames in that link layer at the receiver are then uh, assembled back in together into packets, and then those packets are, are sent up to the next layer above, the network layer above at the receiver. Okay, so that's where we are, we're at the link layer, one layer above the physical layer most of the time. It's conceivable that in some systems you might actually combine the link layer with the physical layer. We could have done this with our Arduino system. In fact, in our Arduino system, we, uh, we really didn't differentiate between layers at all. Everything was in one software package uh, that was handled in the pulsing of the LEDs in the physical layer. Okay, so that's where we are. Now with this, let me, let me, uh, let me go to the textbook here and discuss a little bit how the te textbook discusses the Reed Solomon codes that appear in the link layer. See if this makes any sense to you. I have it highlighted here. This is uh, uh, the textbook I'm looking at right now. Okay, now let's, we read this right here. So let me pull this up. Uh, let's say red. I'll pick red. So we're starting right here. Um, Reed Solomon codes are based on the fact that every n degree polynomial is uniquely determined by n plus 1 points. For example, um, a linear polynomial, a straight line, is determined completely by knowing two points on the straight line. A quadratic polynomial, parabola, let's say, is completely determined by knowing three points. Knowing three points tells us exactly what the equation of the parabola is. So as we move up, and we go to a third degree polynomial, if we know four points on the curve, we know it exactly. So uh, the Reed-Solomon codes are based on this fact. Now, extra points on the same line are redundant. In other words, if I have a straight line and I know three or four points, I know all these points lie in the straight line, so I have more points than I need. Now, suppose we are transmitting the coordinates for these points, and there could be an error in the transmission of one of the points, so we get one of the points is not on the straight line. So we have, let's say we're transmitting four points, one is an error. Three of the points are on the straight line, one isn't. Well, we can still determine the equation for the straight line by looking at the three points that are in the straight line, and we then um, can, uh, uh, can proceed error-free if we, if we have our system set up to interpret this. So this is the basic idea here with the Reed solomon codes. Now, so it says, imagine we have two data points that represent a line, and we send those two data points plus two checkpoints chosen to lie on the same line. If one of the points has received an error, we can still recover the data points by fitting a line to the received points. Three of the points will lie on the line. One point, the one in error, will not. By finding the line, we have corrected the error. Now, Reed-Solomon codes are actually defined as polynomials that operate over finite fields, okay, but they work in a similar fashion that I just described. Now, polynomials over finite fields. You almost surely don't know what that is because to really understand what this is, you have to have some understanding of, um, of number theory, of abstract algebra, where these kinds of things are discussed which is one of the reasons why I think we should be teaching our computer science um, some abstract algebra, because it keeps popping up over and over again. You need it to do encryption. Uh, you need it to really understand Reed-Solomon Reed codes. It keeps popping up in applications and in, in technologies in computer science. Okay, now we want to fit M symbols right here, so M symbols, M bit symbols, sorry. We have, we, want to, we have M bit symbols, so let's say we have eight bit symbols. The code words, then we take these symbols and we collect them into code words. 
Now, typically, we pick our code words to be 2M minus 1 symbols long. So a popular choice is to make M equal 8. I think that's what we may have chosen in our Arduino system. Even though we were using 7-bit ASCII codes, I think we actually transmitted 8 bits, if my memory is right on that. So a popular choice is to make M equals 8 so that the symbols are actually bytes. Okay, so typically bytes are 8 bits. A code word then, being 2 to the M minus 1, it becomes 255 bytes long. So here we have, this is how long the code word is, and we talk about a 255 comma 233 code, for example. It adds 32 redundant symbols to 233 data bits. Okay, now these redundant symbols are then can be used as part of the Reed Solomon code. Okay, so let's look at this. Let me shrink that down. Ah, come on. Why am I having trouble with this now? Oh, I know why. Sorry. Let me get out of this. There we go. Okay, now. And um, the Reed Solomon codes are widely used in practice because of their strong error correction properties. It said right here. Particularly for burst errors. So, for example, if we have a scratch on a CD, that typically introduces burst errors. And I'll talk about this a little bit more uh, in a moment. Um, and if we have uh, a digital subscriber line, DSL, data over cable, so digital subscriber line, uh, DVDs, CDs, Blu-ray discs, and because they are based on M-bit symbols, a single bit error and an M-bit burst error are both treated simply as one symbol error. Why is this? What does this mean? Well, if we're transmitting a whole symbol as 8 bits, and there's one error in those 8 bits, we have a symbol error. Now, all 8 bits can be in error, but it's still just a single symbol error. So that's, that's what that statement uh, means right there is that as far as that is concerned, as far as the error in the transmitted message, in that case, a single bit error and an 8-bit error would end up giving you the same results. Now, um, when 2T redundant symbols, 2T right here, redundant symbols are added, a Reed solomon code is able to correct up to T uh, errors and any transmitted symbols. This means, for example, that the 255-233 code, which has 32 redundant symbols, can correct up to 16 symbol errors. Since the symbols may be consecutive and they are each 8 bits, an error burst of up to 128 bits can be corrected. The situation is even better if the error model is one of erasures. That's like a, a scratch on a CD that obliterates some symbols. In this case, up to 2T errors can be corrected. Okay, so that's kind of explaining why Reed Solomon codes are useful. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, why or how this is, can be important. Now, what I want to do here is um, I want, uh, I've just referred to a section in the textbook on Reed Solomon codes right here, right in here. Read in our textbook, the Data Link Layer Chapter 3, page 208 of the Tannenbaum 5th edition textbook. Now, I, in addition to that, I want you to look at a YouTube video uh, produced by someone else. And the YouTube video is linked right here. You see that blue link right there. There's the, the link to the YouTube video. Now this particular application actually has to do with uh, RAID disk systems. And uh, you probably have wondered how RAIDs work. How we can take a RAID with four disks, four separate hard drives, and we could take any one of those four hard drives, let's say, out of the RAID, but still the RAID can reconstruct the data 
Uh, and um, it's because it may have used a Reed Solomon code. It could also have used a uh, Hamming code. But, like I said, the Reed Solomon codes are used in some raids. And, and this particular uh, YouTube video link there it discusses the application to raids, but I think hopefully you can see that whether you're talking about correcting bit errors in raids or bit errors in packet transmissions, it's basically the same idea. You're correcting bit errors. Okay, now, so, now uh, I want to explain to you exactly uh, how CDs work. Now, you may actually have some CDs laying around your house. I don't think uh, many people are buying them anymore. But, um, uh, man, this is a great example I used to do in class with a great experiment. So you, if you actually have some CDs laying around, I want to show you a way you can demonstrate for yourself the power of these Reed Solomon codes. Okay, now first I want to begin by showing you what the, uh, if we take a CD and we put it under an electron microscope, and Ed Coyle and I did this back when we were professors at Purdue. Ed Coyle has since moved on to Georgia Tech, and uh, I'm retired. I've been to Purdue in a long time, but I was at Purdue for 18 years. And uh, so let me explain how, uh, how a CD works, because my guess is it works differently than you have imagined. Okay, now let me just go down to the next diagram here. Here's, a, here's my beautiful picture of a CD. Uh, I think Picasso first did this. And the CD has all the data on a, on a spiral track. And it starts in the center. Let me come back up here. Starts in the center here, right here. And uh, so it starts right there and it spirals out from the center. And so the, all the music is recorded on that single spiral track that starts in the center. And uh, you know your first track of music, your first song on your CD, will be, let's say, in the tracks that range from the center out to here. And then going out a little bit further gives you the second song on the CD and so on. So we have this spiral track as the CD rotates, and we use a, uh, a laser, uh, an infrared laser, let's say, to read the data uh, off, of the, uh, off of the CD. Now, how does this work? So let's go back now to the, to the symbol, to the diagram above here. This, by the way, is uh, this document I've posted on the Moodle, uh, and it should be one of the recent documents posted. Maybe it'll say Read Solomon Codes on it. I haven't posted it yet. And, okay, so if we take a CD and put it under electron microscope, and then we magnified the image of the CD by 10,600 times, so quite a bit, an optical microscope typically maxes out at a thousand magnification. So this is well over what you would get with an optical microscope. And indeed, uh, we have some of the dimensions here, uh, and we're showing the surface of the CD. And what we have is that the, the, you have along the track going like this are pits. And you see the pits in there. And it is the lengths of the pits and the distance between the pits which actually stores the data on the CD. So, for example, we, and we have sequences of zeros. So, for example, the, the data between the pits might record a whole set of zeros data points. And then we have this edge. And then going from this edge to this edge, uh, all of the sample locations represent ones. So we have the music on the CD as stored in sequences of zeros and one, ones called a run length code. And then if you 
uh, get a scratch on the CD, imagine that you have a big swath of the scratch comes across here and kind of destroys whole collections of these pits. So the, uh, the CD tries to read the information off of those pits and it's just totally wiped out. Okay, so uh, this is how a music CD works, similar to how DVD or Blu-ray disc works. And uh, one of the big differences though, uh, CD uses an infrared laser, a Blu-ray uh, uses a blue laser and and because the laser light there let's say is has roughly half the wavelength of the infrared laser used in a CD it means that we can re record four times the amount of information on the blu-ray as we can get in a regular DVD which uses an infrared laser. So CDs, DVDs use infrared lasers, Blu-rays use blue, and this is why they can get so much more information. Again, I'd be surprised if uh, many of you are purchasing DVDs and Blu-rays anymore, but, so, but that's one of the reasons why there was a big push. There was a great um, competition between U.S and European and Japanese companies back in the day to develop blue LEDs to because each each group wanted to be the first to come out with these Blu-ray players. Okay, so uh, this is this is how that works, and uh, so we the data is coming in. Here is a line along the spiral, and this is the same spiral now okay just a little bit closer in toward the center of the uh, CD so we have this one long continuous spiral that then goes out and that's how the data is recorded okay so now what I want you to do and I mentioned this already but I'm gonna put this particular uh, document onto uh, onto the Moodle. Now, here's an experiment you can do if, if you happen to have a CD laying around. I used to do it in class with my students at Purdue. <clears throat> and um, what I would do is take the CD and then take a black Sharpie and make a wedge where I just paint it over with the Sharpie over everything right there. So for example, um, here, let me do it in blue. So, so I just painted over a wedge here with the black Sharpie. And when I did that, I covered over all the data in these spiral tracks. And so it was like having this really incredible scratch. Then I put the CD in a CD player and start to play it. And the question is, I play the first song here, which is the part of the track in this first section right in here. So I play the first song and I don't hear any problem. So the error correcting code has managed to recover the hidden the hidden bits. Okay, then I record the second song. So these are all the tracks running through this region. And I still get the song with apparently no errors in it. So the error correcting code has managed to recover the second song. So what I would do is I'd keep playing out more and more songs going further and further out. Now the reason uh, why I did this is because as I went further and further out, I got more and more a greater length of track that was wiped out. So eventually, the tracks got so long so that the error correcting code couldn't correct the burst error. So that was, that was a little experiment I used to do for my class to demonstrate the effect of the error correcting codes on music CD. So you might want to try this if you have any CDs around, um, especially ones you're not listening to anymore. 
and I would use a Sharpie and make a wedge on that. Now, you put a wedge on there, you know, the odds are I think you could probably clean it off by using soap and water and or some alcohol. And uh, to, if you, even if you cover it with an indelible Sharpie, you should be able to pull that off. So now, and the other thing is, as I've said, please, 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 here, um, look at this. I'm not, uh, not talking about this, which gives you a little bit more technical detail on how the Reed Solomon code works. And I'm not talking about that because it's already been very well done on that video that's already been posted by someone else on YouTube. So with that, uh, that is my extended discussion of Reed Solomon codes and, uh, and good luck.